All right. Um, so over the past couple of days, we've taken you. Over the past couple of days, we've taken you through uh, different portions of the, the Rosetta libraries. Um, and so I guess for this, this talk, I'm going to take you through uh, various miscellaneous protocols, you know, things that didn't really fit better anywhere else. So it's a little bit of a grab bag, so uh, please bear with me. Um, so yeah, so sort of a tour through the, some of the protocols. So some stuff in protocol six, some in protocols four. Um, we're going to be t touching on things that are in basic and numeric. And I guess as was mentioned previously, this is sort of the way um, protocols are, are laid out. You know, you, do, you don't just stick pr a protocol in, in a single protocol level in Rosetta. Um, you know, portions of the protocol get in a certain li in library level, but then, you know, supporting classes might better be suited for numeric or basic or core. And so you should, instead of having everything all together, you should sort of uh, more s spread it out so that it uh, inhabits the library levels a bit more logically. And so other people can also take advantage of, of the things that you're working with. Um, so the first thing I'm going to be talking about is the resource manager. And so the resource manager was um, created to solve a, a particular problem. So in standard job distribution with the JD2, you know, for example, you have fixed BB and you're calling it on several different uh, PDBs and you're giving it a res file to specify what sort of mutations you're going to be making in this fixed backbone redesign problem. You know, and that works very well. But what if you don't have a, a single res file that you want to use um, on each of the PDBs? What if you want to have a, a different res file for each of the different PDBs? So, you know, get PDB1 gets a mute1 res file and PDB2 gets mute2 res file. The problem with this is that the, the current system for, you know, reading res files isn't set up to handle matching up the res files with, with the PDB inputs. Um, and so, you know, trying to do, you know, this with that sort of thing doesn't work. So we need a system that would be, allow us to take, you know, some of these additional parameters like different res files and match them up to particular inputs in different jobs. Um, you know, we could potentially split this up into multiple runs. So, you know, one run for PDB1 and then a separate, completely separate command for PDB2. Um, but sometimes that might not work properly. So is there, is there a way we can get Rosetta in a single run to, to match up these different files with the appropriate input structures? And so we, well, the way we do that is the resource manager. And like Rosetta Scripts, the resource manager uses XML to represent um, jobs and how to match up resources and various options with those jobs. And so here we have uh, you know, JD2 resource manager job inputter, which is you know, sort of the out outer tag. And within it, we have this jobs tags that list individual jobs. Um, and each of these jobs then has uh, various options. For example, you have you know, the starting structure and you can give the starting structure for each job. And then along with each of the starting structures, now you can specify uh, a particular option. And so for this particular starting structure, uh, Rosetta will behave like you pass the, the flag packing res file equals to you know, mute one res file. And then to, to run this particular job, you can run uh, the fixed BB Linux GCC release and give it the JD2 research definition files of this XML file and then the, the resource manager and the job distributor will collaborate and then you know, each of these jobs will be run and each PDB would then have its own uh, res file that it's associated with. So how this works is that there is a, uh, there's the class resource manager um, under basic resource manager. Um, this is a, a base class for a singleton object um, and the, this base class that happens to be a pure virtual. So um, you would have to uh, subclass it in order for it to actually use the class. And this specifies the, the interface for handling resource management. So loading and destroying resources, uh, managing options and, and correlating, that sort of thing. Um, the, currently there's only one imp actual implementation of the resource manager and that's the JD2 resource manager found in protocols JD2, JD2 resource manager. 
Um, and this is what handles the parsing of the XML and, and setting up and corresponding the resources that are specified in the XML script um, to the, the actual resource manager and then uh, from that specification. Um, so to uh, actually use the resource manager and take advantage of it in your protocols, um, it's, the resource manager is already is automatically managed when you, when you ask for it, um, like most singleton instances. So you just, in your protocol, in your mover, to take advantage of the resource manager, you would do something like this. You know, if res so resource manager git instance has option packing res file, or if it was directly set um, on the command line. So you can say, okay, do we have a, a res file specified for this, for this particular run? And if yes, we can parse the res file, um, and then we call the resource manager to get the option for this packing res file. Um, and the resource manager for options is specialized enough, uh, and it knows that it can go to the options command, so it's um, the command line. So if you can either specify it with a resource uh, manager XML script or on the command line, um, and this get option will get the appropriate value for it. So, okay, um, I, I'm, I wasn't quite sure of that. I mean, so this is an example that I pulled directly from the, the Rosetta code base at the moment. Yes. And so um, there's two issues to it. Uh, one, you could not just set condition explicitly fit. Um, so based on the connection, you can set the condition explicitly fit. Yes. And then the second is that Okay, um, so to repeat for those of, uh, watching the video, uh, the question was whether or not this uh, sort of double condition was necessary. Do you have to call both has option and also uh, contact the, the options? Um, and the, the thought is it might not be necessary because the research manager does have a, a, a fallback option um, and it's so it hopefully should be able to tell you know, whether or not this, this option is specified. Um, and so this, this may not be necessary, even though this is an example from uh, the Rosetta code base. Um, certainly for the git option, there is that fallback configuration, so you wouldn't have to do uh, that sort of um, thing. Um, so the research manager doesn't just take care of options. Um, you can also manage other co uh, more complex data types with the resource manager. Um, and so here's a, a, a little more extensive um, example. Um, and so here for, you have resource options. So you can have options on about how to set up the resources. Um, and you, know, you can specify a particular resource. And there's also resource locators to tell the resource manager where to find particular uh, resources. Um, and then you know, e when you do the resources, you can specify what options you're using, where these locations are, and then when you specify the job, you, know, you, can, you can specify which particular resource you're pulling from. And so for all of this example is set up such that you can take you know, a particular starting structure and you're pulling that starting structure out of a, uh, a, 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 a database format. All right. And so to handle uh, arbitrary resources, uh, here is um, the, sort of the, the, the classes involved. So you have a resource options class, um, which you can subclass for each of the different resource types that you want to manage. Um, again, we, you know, with resource options creators, because we're doing an abstract factory with a, a, you know, parsing XML. Um, and so these, these encompass the, the options that you're using to load the resource. There's resource locators, which encompass where you should find a particular resource. Uh, again, subclass for each resource type. Again, abstract factory. Um, then you have a resource loader, um, which can take uh, re both the resource options and the resource locator objects um, to figure out you know, how does it load a resource you know, and, to, and to, lo to load that resource. And then finally, you have your, your basic resource manager resource OP, 
which is the actual representation of a resource. And this is actually a, a type def for anything that derives from ref, an OP to anything that derives from reference count. So basically anything in Rosetta that's sort of a standard Rosetta type can be considered to be a, a resource. And so all you need to do in order to make that object that you just create have um, be managed by the resource manager is to set up this system where you have a resource loader that would be able to load that particular object based on the configuration that someone gives you in an XML file. And then so to use the resource manager with your arbitrary resource types, um, once all of that's been set up, um, what you, all you would need to do is then in your protocols, in your mover where you would want to get access to whatever resource is being specified in the XML, you would just say, you know, call the, the, the basic resource manager, get resource. You know, it's type def on whatever particular type of resource you have. Um, and then you just give it a, a resource description, which tells you which particular resource you want. Or alternatively, if you had wanted to do more complex logic, you could say, tell, see if, if the resource has been specified um, with this function. And the resource manager is, is, is documented um, on the Rosetta Commons wiki um, and the address there if you want to learn some more information. All right. So uh, another thing that I'm, we're going to talk about is the, the features reporter. And the rationale for this is you know, working with large amounts of data. So in Rosetta, we tend to work with uh, large numbers of structures and then you know, working on, on different starting structures and various things. And we have um, a whole bunch of data, you know, scores and structures and, and, and various um, metrics that we're working with. And how do we wrangle this, this large amount of data? How do we you know, condense it out and, and represent it in a form that's uh, useful? Um, and sort of, so one, of, one example that where this uh, um, features reporter became in useful is in the transition from score 12 to Tolaris 2013. Um, and one of the things that um, Andrew and Matt O'Mara saw was the fact that if you have, um, look at the, the distribution of hydrogen bonds um, around certain atoms in the PDB, you get sort of this nice two-lobed feature. And so this, this figure is, was made by taking from the PDB, uh, calculating the geometries of different hydrogen bonding groups of the PDB as is, and then plotting the density of, uh, of where those uh, hydrogen bonding group geometries fall. Um, but when you start you know, relaxing and minimizing with score 12, this sort of falls apart. Um, but then when you change the behavior of the hydrogen bonding potential, uh, to what we ha now have in Tolaris 2013, you can then recover that nice two-lobed feature. And so this work that was to improve the, the, the Rosetta score function to give us you know, Tolaris 2013 with the, the much nicer, uh, much more natural hydrogen bonding features was greatly facilitated by the features reporter in the fact that you could collect this data across a large number of structures, across ones that have been relaxed with score 12, ones that re have been relaxed with various experimental uh, score functions to see how does you know, this density change uh, propagate as you change the score function. And so the way the features reporters works is it takes advantage of relational databases. And relational databases are a way to um, represent complex data um, by breaking it down into sort of uh, simpler forms. And it represents data um, in a tabular format. So you have things like you know, protein experiment and result, and you have lines you know, for, you know, for this result, for this protein in this experiment. Um, and it's relational because there's multiple tables and each of the entries in the tables can relate to other tables. For example, here you have various entries for protein 1 and protein 2, and you can have more information on protein 1 and protein 2 um, in a different table. For example, protein 1 is a GPACR with a, you know, an X-ray structure, um, whereas protein 2 is a cytochrome protein also with an X-ray structure. And by having relations between these different tables, um, then you can build up more complex representations of the data from uh, relatively simple uh, data sets. Um, and this is actually a standard data storage method, um, and it's used widely throughout um, the computing world. 
you know, most of the information that's being stored um, for various purposes tends to be stored in relational databases. It's really the workhorse of uh, the, the various computational um, usage uh, across, across the world. And the way you interact with relational databases is standardized in what's an SQL or structured query language. Um, yeah, it's the standard for interacting with relational databases. And it's a method to specify how do you combine um, and interact and retrieve data from the, the tables that are in a relational database. Um, and so here's a, a sample of what structured query language looks like. And so you have, you specify, you know, from what tables you're trying to pull the information. Uh, for example, you have structure scores and structure PDBs, um, and you can give them aliases, and you can specify what exactly what data you're pulling out of those tables. For example, we want from the the PDB structure PDBs table, we want to pull out what type uh, of of struct of PDB it is, and then from the the scores tables, we want to actually pull out the result, uh, the value of the, that from the score table, and then you can do uh, more complex combining and filtering. For example, here we're saying here, we want to make sure that the, we're, we're only combining rows where the, the protein identifiers match. Um, and then also we were filtering, so we only want PDBs where the source comes from an X-ray, and we only want um, scores from, where, from experiment B. Um, and so from this, you can you know, have this large amount of data that you can very easily combine and filter and get just the information that you need that you can then use in your, your downstream applications. For example, like you know, plotting that nice um, hydrogen bond distribution graph. Um, so in the features reporters, we have a whole bunch of features reporters um, that are interrelated. And this is only like a, a small portion of the complete features reporters schema showing you, you know, the sort of what sorts of tables are available and sort of the interactions and relationships between the different um, portions of the features reporter. Um, all right. So to actually store the information we use uh, in a relational database, we use a database engine. And there's sort of multiple different options we can potentially use for that. Um, one of the options is SQLite. Um, and for SQLite, it's, uh, the database is just a file on your, your uh, hard drive. Um, and for SQLite, Rosetta handles all database interactions sort of internally. Um, the limitation, it's a, it's a very simple format. There's some limitations in the fact that it's not um, as extensive of type checking um, and validation as some of the other uh, relational database engines. Um, and it's also limited by file system durability. Um, you can very easily bring down a cluster's file system um, by using SQLite databases. Um, this has happened multiple times in the, in the Rosetta community where someone has um, tried to write, read and write from an SQLite database on, on a networked file system on their the cluster and just because of the, the out input and output load um, has actually brought down the entire cluster because of it. Um, so it's recommended if you are using SQLite to, to do that on a local disk as opposed to a networked file system. Um, a little bit more robust is some of the, the, the um, other database engines like MySQL and PostgreSQL. Um, and as opposed to SQLite, where, which is just a, a file access for a database, these are client server architectures. So instead of, Rosetta doesn't handle the database uh, itself. Instead, it communicates with a, a database server. So you would need to set up a, a, one of, a, a server for one of these databases um, on a computer in your lab in order to interact with it. Um, and then again, you would tell Rosetta to connect with a username, host, port, and password you know, to con communicate with the server to store and retrieve the data. Um, so you can have specialized, hard, uh, dedicated hardware. Um, so this scales very well. Um, it also has more strict enforcement of types and more, a little bit more flexible configuration with SQL, than SQLite. The drawback of it, of course, is the fact that you will have to set up the, 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 the database server. Um, so as an aside, you're thinking, OK, so we have this data that we have. It's in tabular format. Why can't we just use CV, CSV files? 
uh, or, or tab separated files or something like that. And, you know, why go to all this trouble for the relational database? Um, and the reason for this is the fact that the relational databases allow us to um, manipulate and work with much more complex data than you can in a simpler tabular format. Um, for example, if, with relational databases, you can have you know, multiple tables, whereas you know, the CSV files are typically just a single table. Um, you can also have explicit table definitions, so you have a defined meaning of each column, whereas you know, CSV files are a little bit more free format and you might not have validation as far as what goes in each column. Um, and again, also, the, with the, you can actually enforce with relational databases what relationships hold between the different columns. Um, and more on that robustness, you know, again, you can force interactions. Um, you also have um, more, uh, it's robust as far as uh, commits, um, so you can, you don't leave the tables in an inconsistent state because of writing errors and stuff. And, ag and again, um, if you use the, the server-based architecture, you don't have a problem with uh, the, the, your disk file system choking under a high load. Um, and also there's speed considerations, again, because uh, the, the, the access is uh, optimized. So in Rosetta, to interact with databases, we have a multi-level architecture. Um, so you have Rosetta modules um, that interact uh, through utility functions in, in uh, source basic database um, with uh, potentially a, a, the database session manager. And then we use the, the interface wrapper CPPDB. And so this is a, a generic wrapper around uh, various different um, database architectures. Um, so the CPPDB handles uh, interactions with the, whether it's SQL Lite or MySQL or Postgres SQL um, in, a, in a uniform fashion. Um, and so to actually use the features reporter, um, this is implemented through Rosetta scripts, and it's the, the report to DB mover. And so you define the report to DB mover. Um, for example, if you're using SQLite, you give it what database, the file name that you're going to store the data in. And then you just list as subtags which feature reporters you have. Um, and you can have you know, a number of different features reporters. And every time this report to DB mover is called on a pose, these feature reporters will, will take information from that pose and store it into the database file that you specified. And there's a large number of feature reporters encompassing a whole bunch of different information um, for you know, protocol information, some more experimental data coming from input PDBs, one body information, two body, multi body, energy functions, structural information. There's a whole bunch of information. And as I mentioned, you know, the, the features reporter framework is flexible enough that if you wanted to, you could create your own features reporter and add your own information to the, t the tables. And all of these feature reporters are documented on the documentation wiki. Um, so I won't go into detail about all of them right now. Um, yeah, and so you can implement your own features reporter class, and there's two main methods that you would have to be concerned yourself with. Um, so write schema to DB would prepare the table. So if you get a completely fresh database, how do you prepare the table? Um, and there's utility methods to make writing this easy. And then the, the main workhorse of the features reporter class is the report features method, which basically just takes and writes the data to your ta table from the, the pose that it's given. And this is, this is uh, relatively straightforward using some of the utility methods that are provided in basic database and, and very simple SQL. Um, and uh, again, I'll mention that features reporters are created with the abstract factory pattern. Um, so you should all know what this means, you know, creators, registrators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for um, database support with Rosetta, um, SQLite support is compiled in by default. Um, you can specify which database file you want with the report to db tag, or also there's other options. There's um, the database name file. 
Um, if you want to use MySQL or PostgreSQL, um, you can't use it um, with the default compiles. Uh, the reason for this is there's um, differences in platforms and libraries as far as compiling and support. Um, and so we don't compile in uh, support for these databases by default. Um, instead, what you would need to do is you would need to specify uh, two scans in your, your sites, for example, your site settings file, um, where to find the, the headers and the libraries for uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL support. And then you would need to compile um, Rosetta with an, uh, an extras build. So you give it extras equals MySQL to compile for MySQL support. And then when you run Rosetta for MySQL, you have to give it more information, for example, you know, to tell it that you use MySQL mode and then where to find the server and how to connect with the server. Um, so you've stored the data from your features reporter. Now how do you actually use the data? And unfortunately that's sort of dependent on use case. Um, how exactly you want to process your data um, it, it, you know, depends on a case by case basis. Um, there's already a large processing framework for data in, in main test features. Um, if you're interested in the features reporter, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, it's a little bit overwhelming at first, but um, there's a lot there. Um, but mainly what you would do was you would interact with whatever particular scripting system you're interested in. There's SQL support for a large number of scripting systems, Python, Perl, R, what have you. You know, there is, there is some module that you can probably find that allows you to interact with, you know, whatever da database that you have written your data to. Um, and then you would basically just create uh, an SQL statement that would pull out the information from your database. For example, this is a little bit uh, a complicated one, but it's not too much. Uh, so basically what you're doing here is you're trying to match div um, the divergence from the rotom recovery um, to the, the the name three, so the residue type. And you're doing that specifically for a, a limitations. Um, for example, you, know, you, for, you don't want a B factor that's too high. Um, you, don't want, you, you don't want a buried SASA that's too much, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's a bunch of limitations. Um, and you can make a very complex um, uh, query so that you can filter out just the information that you're looking from from this, this large complex data set that you've made with your features reporter. And there's an uh, additional uh, faint reading material for anyone who's interested in uh, pursuing that. So switching gears again, uh, there's the, the, talking about Rosetta Remodel. And so Rosetta Remodel is a, a framework or an application that allows you to do loop modeling, and it's loop modeling tailored for design. Um, so there, here's from the, uh, the Rosetta Remodel paper, uh, gives an example of a, a large number of things that uh, people can potentially do with Remodel. Um, for example, you can design desulfides, you can extend or delete um, regions of your protein, uh, circular permutations, you can graft motifs, um, you can do tethered docking. Uh, there's, a, a, there's a number of different um, uh, design protocols that one can do using the, the Rosetta Remodel framework. And sort of the core of the Rosetta Remodel framework is the, the concept of a blueprint file. And a blueprint file is basically a way of specifying you know, how you want to change your protein. Um, and it's a, a column-based format where you have the, the pose number of your residue. Um, you have the amino acid identity of the residue, and this, is, this second column is used for fragment purpose, picking purposes. Um, the secondary structural de designation, uh, and then additional columns for more information. For example, if you wanted to do fixed backbone design, um, you could specify yeah, uh, res file-like uh, designators like PIK-AAA to force an, an alanine there. Um, you can also do backbone remodeling where you specify what particular secondary structure you want a region of the protein to be. And then remodel will go through and use uh, fragment-based techniques to insert fragments for this particular secondary structure 
and do uh, loop remodeling in this region. Um, you can also extend and delete residues uh, from the pose. Um, you can add various interaction constraints between different residues for the pose. Um, it supports symmetry. You can uh, add on additional uh, residues so you can make a de, a de novo structure with re remodel. Um, and there's also support for various uh, disulfide building. So if, if you wanted to build a disulfide between two particular regions of a protein, you could use Rosetta Remodel to figure out where she should place the, the disulfide such that it will make a, a good disulfide bond. Um, not shown in that figure, uh, you can also insert domains. Um, so there's a, a flag and there's a special uh, secondary structural tag that you can say, I want to insert uh, a, a domain from a particular protein. And this can be used for epitope grafting. Um, and so here's uh, a sort of a scientific example where that domain insertion, epitope grafting, is in being used. And so this is in uh, HIV vaccine design. So this is the, the HIV env protein. And there's a, this V1, V2 loop. And so what they wanted to do was um, make uh, the HIV env protein more immunogenic uh, um, by inserting this uh, HGM-CSF uh, uh, cytokine protein um, within the V1, V2 loop. And so they then used Rosetta Remodel to insert this, the, this large protein uh, into the place where the V1, V2 loop uh, usually goes. Uh, to create a more immunogenic uh, HIV env protein. Um, so in the code, the sort of the, the main overview would be the, the protocols forge remodel remodel mover. And so this is, encodes the top level logic as far as uh, handling remodel. Um, and it, it applies the substages and accumulates the results. Um, there's a, a remodel data object which stores various parsed blueprint data, um, and there's also uh, Protocols Forge build build manager, which manages the various substages of building, and those various substages are represented by sub-objects in, in this uh, particular namespace. All right. Another protocol is the matcher protocol. And the rationale for this comes out of the enzyme design efforts. So in enzyme design, the, the basic concept is trying to uh, minimize, uh, sorry, uh, to optimize binding energy to the transition state. And so um, you have the concept of a theozyme, which is your, the transition state for whatever particular reaction you're interested in uh, creating an enzyme for. And then you have also interaction groups that the proteins uh, provides. So by providing these particular interacting groups to the transition state, you lower the transition state energy, and you can calculate this quantum mechanically and find the geometry of these interactions, which will optimally lower the transition state energy and hopefully optimize the, the rate of this particular reaction. And so the trick would be in enzyme design, how can we place these interaction groups around uh, this transition state such that the enzyme protein, this protein can, can optimize the transition state and optimize the reaction. Um, so we need to figure out how we can place side chains on a particular backbone such that they have this geometry. And the way that Rosetta does this is through the matcher. So what the matcher does is it reads in a backbone structure. Uh, it, reads in a ligand definition file, so this is the structure of the transition state, and it also reads in the description of the geometry of that interaction between the side chains and that transition state. And then for each of those interactions, for each of those geometric constraints that it needs to optimize, it builds uh, you know, possible protein rotomers on the backbone, it builds ligand positions based on those geometric constraints, it checks if that ligand uh, position is compatible with the, the backbone of the protein and also with the other constraints um, and discards it if it doesn't. And it keeps doing this for rounds and rounds until it finds ligand positions that are consistent with all of the different constraints. So you can build protein rotomers off of the backbone to form a ligand in the position that you want it to be in. And once that's done, it outputs those matches 
which can then be used in further rounds of design and testing. So how does it figure out whether or not two different ligand positions are compatible? I mean, naively one might think, oh, for one constraint you just make a list uh, of all of the different ligand positions, and then for another constraint you make a list of the ligand positions, and then you go through pairwise and make sure, see if any of them match up. The problem with this is the fact that there's a large number of potential ligand positions, because you can imagine how many different rotomers of the protein, you know, flexibility of the ge geometry, you know, the different positions you could potentially put the, the, the protein side chain on. And so it gets very computationally intensive to go through pairwise and figure it out. So instead, as an optimization, we use um, what's called a hash map. So a hash map is a way of taking a, a large multidimensional space and sort of reducing it to a little bit more uh, manageable size. So in a two-dimensional representation of the hash map, you can uh, consider you know, maybe taking the position and the orientation of the ligand and separating it out into a grid. And so you have uh, different bins and you can figure out, okay, when I build my ligand position, where does that ligand position fall? And you can make an annotations and say, okay, I have ligand positions in all of the filled squares. And so those are, are where the, the constraint is compatible with. So you do that for constraint one. You can also do that for constraint two. And so you get a, a set of uh, different bins uh, in positions in orientation space that are filled. And then once you have those two bins, you can just go through each bin and see, do I have a, a filled bin in each of those constraints? And from that information, you now can more easily figure out whether or not uh, you have a match between these, the, the positions of these two constraints, um, as opposed to trying to go through them pairwise. Um, so, but this is only like two-dimensional. The, the real uh, matcher algorithm works in six-dimensional uh, position and orientation space. Um, so this, is, this algorithm is what we call classic matching in Rosetta. Um, and so what you do is you start with, uh, a, a, for a particular backbone position, um, you start with your side chain and then build from the geometry of your interaction whatever particular ligand that you're trying to match to. Um, and then you do that for all of the different geometries, all of the different ligand conformations, all of the di different rotomer com combinations, um, and you get a set of different ligand positions. You then represent each of these uh, ligand positions via just a, a position and an orientation. Um, and then this position and orientation is what's then used in the, in the hash map to determine whether or not um, a, a ligand position and orientation is compatible between one side chain, uh, one constraint, and another constraint. Um, we also have what's called, what we call secondary matching, and this proceeds slightly differently. Instead of using uh, a um, hash map based system, this actually just builds each of the, the positions for uh, a constraint and then checks to see whether or not that is compatible with an already existing uh, ligand position. All right. um, so as I mentioned, you can get a large number of potential hits. So we have all of these different Rotomer combinations, all of the geometry flexibility. And so you need an efficient way of storing that information. And the way that we store the information efficiently is via um, this hit object. And so this reduces the whole, you know, instead of representing a protein with a particular ligand and all the atoms in the conformation, it reduces that um, orientation of the ligand into a very small representation where we just have uh, the amino acid position, you know, for the side chain that built that position, you know, what protein rotomer it was, what ligand rotomer it was, and the six dimensional position and orientation uh, for that representative of the um, ligand. Um, also, the, since we have six dimensional space, um, that can also take up a lot of space. Um, and so we represent that efficiently with the, the protocols max occupied space hash. 
And so in this, we're not actually storing these hit objects in this hash map, but we're instead we're storing just numbers, indices, to a full list of hits. And so by that method, we, know, we can further cut down on the amount of storage space that we need. And then finally, we have the, the actual hashing algorithm that allows you to, to efficiently you know, translate into a hash map, um, and that's in numeric ge geometry hashing and the 60hasher.hh. All right. Um, and so, as I was mentioning, there is a sort of a, a very complex, you know, multi-step process, and we've split that process into, you know, multiple distinct stages and each cl with classes that represent each of those different stages. Um, so we have separate classes for building residues, um, so the upstream builder. We have a classes for building ligands, which is the downstream builder. We have uh, classes for evaluating whether or not a certain you know, hit is a match with other matches, or other hits, and that's in the downstream algorithm. And we have different things, uh, classes for converting to output. So match filters, match groupers, and output writers. Um, and these are actually base classes. So there's derived classes from each of these base classes that allow you to do diff different things. So if, I mentioned the fact that we had classic matching and secondary matching. Well, both of those protocols are represented by a downstream algorithm. You know, so you have one uh, downstream al algorithm that represents uh, the classic matching protocol, and you actually have two different uh, downstream algorithms um, to represent two different ways of doing the secondary matching. And then by using you know, independent classes for these different stages, you can then combine those classes so you can be flexible as far as you know how you're doing the the building of the different residues how you're doing the the matching um, evaluation and then finally you know the different ways of outputting these matches um, and so there there's a number of different references in case you want to read more so um, loop hash so the, the concept behind loop hash is the fact that you have, maybe you've built a protein and you've built the secondary structural elements of a protein. So you have the secondary structural elements all built, but you're missing the loops that connect those uh, secondary structural elements. How do you figure out what's the structure of the protein in those loop positions? Well, one way you can potentially do that is you can do fragment insertion to you know, build those residues and then try and do loop closure. But an alternative way of doing that is to figure out, well, we know that loops in the PDB tend to be relatively consistent. Can we find a loop from the PDB, a loop structure in the PDB that can, can already sort of close these two residues? Because you know, closing two closely related beta strands is a very you know, common thing that happens in the PDB. Maybe we can just steal an already existing structure and we don't have to worry about you know, building it from scratch. And so that's what the, the, the loop hash tries to do is it says, okay, I need a four amino acid loop that stretches from over here to over there. I can search through the PDB and I can say here, Here's a, a loop that's four amino acids long that will go from here to here, and then I can place those onto my protein, um, and then you know, I now have a structure that will close that loop and represent a, a good structure. Now, in the matcher, we were trying to match up um, a position and an orientation. Of, of the ligand positions and orientations. Well, loop hashing is also a situation where we're trying to match up positions and orientations. Um, but instead of uh, a position and orientation of a ligand in an absolute coordinate frame, what we're looking here is a, a relative position and a relative orientation of the two ends of the loop. So you have here uh, sort of a, a takeoff angle of, of a distance at an orientation um, going from here to here, and what we want to do is we want to match this position and orientation transform, you know, from on the on the, sc the scaffold that we're grafting into, and the loop that we're going to be grafting onto it. 
And so what we can do is we can reuse the six-dimensional hash map system to figure out, to match up these loops you know, with these segments where we want to apply the loops. Uh, and so here's a, a, another figure from the paper. And so you have this rigid body transform going from one location on the protein to another location on the protein. So both, there's both a, a positional uh, location and also like a rotational position orientation. Um, and then you would want to match up you know, alternate loops that could potentially go between those two locations and form a nice closed loop. Um, you would pick a potential one. And then because we're hashing, you know, we're not necessarily going to get something that's going to be exactly the same. So there's going to be a little bit of a discrepancy. And then we can use other things like constrained minimization to, to, mini, to mini, close that discrepancy um, and, and fix up any issues that we have. Um, so the, in loop hash, it's implemented. There's a, a, a loop hashing library, protocols loop hash loop shaft library. So this creates, saves, lo and loads the, the loop hash library for variously sized loops. Um, uh, and it stores the, the loop hash map. Um, and, and the loop hash map is uh, actually the storage, but it's a, a storage of indices to indices to this backbone database. Um, and the reason for, again, this, indiscretion, uh, this in direction, um, this indices to indices, is the fact of storage efficiency. So by, instead of storing a, a data member directly, by storing an index to another database that contains that information, um, you can represent the data much more efficiently. Um, because many of those loops are going to overlap in the, in, in the PDB, you know, from multiple segments, you can sort of shift over one and have another loop. Um, by having, be having this scheme, you can be much more compact in representation. And in fact, um, using this scheme, you can represent the entire PDB database in about uh, less than 100 megabytes. So you can keep the entire PDB database in memory while you're doing this loop hashing algorithm um, and then do sampling over it efficiently. And again, it, that also comes from the reduced representation of the, the protein data bank. You're not storing the complete structures. Instead, you're just storing the backborne torsional angles, which is all you need for um, recapitulating the loops out of the loop hash database. So that's the storage of the loops. Um, how do we actually use them in practice? And so the main, uh, or sort of at least the first use of the loop hash algorithm was for using it to do backbone sampling. So taking a structure, replacing a particular loop with a, another confirmation from the protein database. And that's represented uh, via the, the loop hash sampler mover that takes various sampling parameters um, and, ha and handles um, updating the loop positions. And again, it was used for uh, relaxed sampling. And uh, th there's a, a paper published on that. So I know that's, that, that's a lot, and it's, there's various different things going on there, but uh, that's a summary of some of the more advanced protocols throughout uh, Rosetta. Um, so are there any questions? Yes? So with loop hash, there has to be a one residue overlap at the termini of the existing protein that you have um, going into the loop, so you have to account for that later? Um, I'm not necessarily sure that there has to be, yeah, I mean, so the, there has to be enough, uh, the, the question was, does there have to be a one residue overlap? Um, and there has to be enough of an overlap so you can define the, the position and orientation where you're starting and ending in a consistent fashion between the, the loop that you're grafting on and, and the, the position where you're grafting it onto. So yeah, so the, the, the positions and orientations have to be um, calculated from the same same sort of locate an equivalent location. So there has to be a little bit of overlap between the two. Okay, and then you were saying yesterday, do you superimpose those on or do you build them? Do you build the loop there with just like an add peptide edge or how do you actually put it and then you close the loop and be 
So, okay, so, so how do you actually build, once you've found your loop, how do you actually build it into your structure? Well, as I mentioned that the, the loop hashing database doesn't store the entire structure, it, store, it just stores the backbone torsions. So in applying the loop, it's, you're not actually a, taking the coordinates from the loop. Instead, what you're doing is you're taking and applying the backbone torsional angles um, to, that, to the, the loop that you're, you're trying to manipulate. Yeah.